Okay, the recording is on. Welcome everyone to our class on BC212, Christian Apologetics. Um, this is our final week. So it's gonna be our final two lectures. We've got a little bit of ground to cover and uh, hopefully we should be able to cover that. Just wanted to request somebody in the class to lead us in prayer and then we will get started, please. Jesus, we thank you for this uh, beautiful morning that you've blessed us with, Lord. And uh, thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity and for this time that we can come together and uh, learn more of your word. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help Pastor Ashish as he uh, teaches us um, more about the truth and that um, we would uh, be able to gain the knowledge as well as apply it. Uh, thank you, Father, uh, that we submit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. All right. So we were in our second last chapter, which is we're trying to get a biblical understanding of suffering. We've covered quite a bit of uh, portions on that. We've got a few more, maybe two more thoughts to cover, which we will do right now. Let me quickly review what we have been looking at. So lesson number 15, we're talking about a biblical understanding of suffering. Why is there suffering and so on? How do we understand it theologically? Right? Um, so we said we have to begin with God's heart, understand the heart of God. It is not his intent to cause pain and sorrow and tears. You don't see it in the Garden of Eden, and we don't see it in uh, the new heavens and the new earth. It's taken up. So that's the heart of God, and we need to look at things from that perspective. Secondly, then we said, okay, yeah, it is a present reality. We are now in between those two. We are uh, between the fall and the glorious redemption that's there. And so it is a present reality. We are, you know, people, there is suffering. And there is suffering in all realms, spiritual, emotional, and physical. So why is there suffering? What are the different reasons? And then what is our response? How do we uh, look at it? How do we endure it? So, on. so we are looking at six reasons, biblical, theological reasons that we can give uh, for suffering, why it's there. So we said, first, there is suffering due to the bondage of corruption, which Paul, the Apostle Paul, shares with us in Romans and also in Second Corinthians. There is a suffering due to one's own actions. So we make mistakes, we do wrong things. There's the consequences of that. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Um, there is suffering due to satanic oppression, meaning the devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And so... There is an enemy that's doing these things, causing these things. And so we may, must be aware of it. God has given us weapons to counter those things, to stand against those things. Then there is suffering due to other people's actions, including persecution. That means people do evil things. Uh, there is sin, uh, wickedness, and all kinds of jealousy and hatred and all these things. So people do things. And um, there is suffering because of the actions of people. And uh, we as believers may face that in different contexts. It could be the workplace, it could be in other situations where we will face it. But we must you know, submit to God and trust God that he will bring us up. Now, in that context, um, you know, there's this whole issue of uh, divine protection versus persecution. Will God always protect us from what people do to us? And uh, we see that uh, we can and we should believe God for divine protection, but we also see that there are people who will face the actions of people, May, uh, almost all, the disciples of Jesus, the apostles, were martyred. That means God didn't protect them or God didn't prevent them from being killed. 
and he got killed for the sake of the gospel and for the name of Jesus Christ. So there is both. There are times when you're experiencing divine protection. There will be times when the actions of people uh, affect believers. Now, we don't always understand the dynamic, right? But why is it that some people suffer persecution, are killed, lose their lives? Uh, we, we don't always understand that, but we know that we can believe God for protection, but we do not love our lives even to the point of death. And if that's what's going to be required, we are committed to that, which we will hold on to our faith in Jesus till that point. Why doesn't God always prevent people, his people from being martyred, protected, uh, etc.? We don't understand. We leave that to God. And these are, that's a mystery that you know we definitely don't have a clear answer for. So our response is, uh, we believe that God will protect us, deliver us from every evil work. Uh, and uh, if we need to die, we would be ready to do that. Number five, there is suffering because of divine discipline and judgment. So divine discipline is when God is correcting us as believers. We are walking with him, we are sincere, but in areas that we need correction, God will correct us, and he would correct us primarily through his word, through the scriptures, through the promptings of his spirit, and through other people. So three ways that God lovingly corrects us. He brings a discipline into our lives. And even that discipline may not be easy to receive you know, because we have the flesh to deal with and we need to be willing to yield to that discipline. So that itself is a process of suffering or yielding to it. For some, in some situations, it'd be wonderful, easy to do. In some situations where the flesh is in the way, it's going to be difficult, painful. But that's part of God's loving correction for those of us, for those of us who are walking in line with God. Now, there is the other side where if people are out of the will of God, I mean, they're, they've wandered away from God, wandering in sin and, and so on. There we do see divine judgment in order to draw people to himself. It's not judgment to push people away, but God draws people to himself. So even in judgment, there is mercy. So uh, this judgment could take place uh, uh, where God may use human elements to do this or get people's attention. And the whole thing is to draw people to himself and not to push people away. But this isn't the case when people have gone away uh, from God. So there is mercy, there is grace, but then when we walk away from that place of mercy and grace, there are times when we see in scripture, God will, there is divine judgment and God brings people. And we see that even taking place in the house of God, in the church. Uh, we see Ananias and Sapphira, we see the young man at Corinth that Paul says, you've got to take action against him. Paul writes about Hymenius and Alexander, people who once were in the faith, they've gone away from the faith, and now they're disturbing the people who are in faith. And so Paul says, you know, I give them up to Satan. So that means he's saying, look, now they're outside. You know, I, I'm not here to protect them. God and you know, God will just give them up, and they're going to face the consequences of what they're doing. Hopefully, they will turn back to God. That's you know, that how they respond to it is different. It's, it's entirely up to people, right? But that then we see that in Scripture, divine judgment. Um, so that's something we must keep in mind. Um, the last reason is also. It is suffering due to willing sacrifice. That means we are willingly taking this on. Jesus said, we must take up our cross and follow him. The cross symbolizes or represents a place of suffering. It's a place of separation from the world. It's a place of sacrifice. That's the cross. So you, you take it on willingly. You carry your cross. I mean, you're willingly saying, Lord, I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to separate myself from the world. I'm willing to make sacrifices. Right? So this is something we do willingly. 
and then we may suffer for it. So what do you mean? That means we give up certain pleasures, we face certain consequences of, of choosing to serve the Lord, of choosing to um, pursue God's plan for our lives. So there is that suffering that comes in there, discomfort maybe, uh, maybe even the displeasure of people or the disapproval of people, so on and so forth. Suffering can come in those ex in those manner. So we see, for example, Abraham. He left his family, left his own country. He went away. Moses, he gave up his privileges that he could have enjoyed in Egypt in order to step out and be with the people of God. Paul, he travels so much. He endured so much hardship, physical hardship, in order to bring the gospel to people. That was something he chose willingly. And yes, there was demonic opposition. People attacked him. And there were things he did willingly, saying, I'm willing to take up this sacrifice in order to take the gospel to people. So these are willing sacrifices that put us in a place of hardship, but we do it for the glory of God, for the purpose of God. Now, of course, we must keep in mind that we need to do our sacrifices led by the Holy Spirit rather than our own fleshly sacrifices. What do we mean by fleshly sacrifice? It means things that I do just to make myself feel good, and God really doesn't want me to do that. Example, I'll just given as an example. Some of us, God may say, I want you to give your entire life to the preaching of the gospel. Some of us, God may say, I want you to work a job and serve, serve me. Now, if that's the call of God, and if somebody, God has called somebody to do that, but that person just gives up their job, they don't want to work, and they say, no, I'm going to serve God. Uh, and then they face the consequences of that decision, which is maybe they don't have enough money, they're struggling financially, etc. That kind of suffering is a fleshly sacrifice because that is not what God wanted them to do. But they did it themselves, their own choice. And they can think that they're suffering for the sake of Christ, but actually it's, it's a choice they made out of the will of God. God's will was for them to work, earn, and serve. But they chose not to do it. Now, that's a fleshly sacrifice because that's not the will of God. Now, would God help them in spite of it? Yeah, there's mercy. So uh, uh, in spite of those wrong choices, God would be merciful, help them through it. Uh, but that is a fleshly sacrifice because it's not something God wanted them to do for themselves. So we must understand that it's important for us in whatever we do, you know, we understand God's will. Now, there is suffering according to the will of God, which means that when we are doing righteousness or we're standing for the name of Christ, people will do things against us. That is what we would say suffering according to the will of God. That means God says, look, that's part of your life on earth. Just stand. Don't give up. People will persecute us for righteousness sake. People will persecute us for being, you know, standing up for our faith in Christ. That's suffering according to the will of God. I mean, it's God's will that we stand through that suffering. We don't give up on it. Right? Then there is suffering that's not according to the will of God. What is it? Our own wrongdoing. Right? We do wrong things. That's not the will of God. Right? Or suffering because of demonic opposition, oppression. The devil does things. God says, look, I've given you the weapons. You fight those things. Don't accept it. You fight those things. So understand the distinction. What is suffering according to the will of God and suffering not according to the will of God? I mean, this is not God's will for us as believers, right? So these are things we can correct ourselves. These are things we endure joyfully, uh, knowing that it brings glory and honor to God. And God is glorified through that kind of suffering. Okay. Um, I'll cover the rest of this uh, chapter and then we'll take questions. So this leads us to this part, you know, why, what is the benefit of experiencing or enduring suffering? 
Why does God love that? Why couldn't God have said, uh, if you believe in Jesus, you will not suffer. You will have no pain, no sorrow uh, for the rest of your life. Why does he allow us to go through this? Uh, why does he allow us to endure? What is the good that's coming out of this? Well, we need to keep in mind that, and this is what the scriptures teach us, that first of all, enduring hardship is going to help build character. And that is one of the important ways by which character is developed in our lives. That's the way we can prove our character. Right? Uh, of course, character is developed in us through the word of God, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the character of Christ is formed in us. But how can you prove it? How can you show that you have that in you? Well, the only way you can show it is by living it out and living it out through adversity. It's easy to say, oh, praise the Lord, and everything is going good. That's easy. But can we still praise the Lord when things are tough, things are difficult? We've got challenges, we've got pressure. Can we still say praise the Lord? Right? So that's, that's where we actually prove our character. And when we're able to do that, that reinforces or strengthens our character, and we keep going from glory to glory. And the scriptures teach us about that. Secondly, this, this, why does God allow us to go through these things? Because through these, God actually carries out the pruning that's needed for us to be more fruitful. What is pruning? Pruning is taking away the unnecessary things. So Jesus used the analogy of uh, the vine and the branches. And he said, you know, if any branch in me is bearing fruit, what am I going to do? What is the father going to do? He's going to prune it so that it can be more fruitful. Right? So you're bearing fruit. The way to become more fruitful is to let God prune us. What is pruning? Cut up the unnecessary things. So how would God do that? Of course, he would do it by his word, by speaking to us by his spirit, through the influence of godly people, and also through the adversity, the pressure we face, things will be taken up, the unnecessary things taken up, but it's always bringing us to a place of greater fruitfulness. So we can look at the positive effects of going through adversity or suffering, that it's actually going to lead us to a place of greater fruitfulness. And number three, what is the good that comes out of it? That somehow, through that, what we endure, the kingdom of God is advanced through our lives. Right? That we endure hardship, but God's kingdom is advanced. We may make the sacrifices, but God's kingdom is advanced. Other people are blessed. His word it goes forth. Mm. Believers, are, other believers are encouraged. So that's the good that comes out of it. We may face the hardship, but his kingdom is extended, right? His kingdom is uh, furthered through our lives. So these are three things we should just remember. Look, if and when we suffer according to the will of God, remember these three things. Our character is being strengthened. We are going to be more fruitful in our lives. And the kingdom of God is going to be furthered or extended through our lives, through the sacrifices that we make. The last point, that, uh, or the last two points that we want to make, consider here, and then we'll take questions, is what should our posture be when we face something? How should we go through it? Well, some thoughts here. One, the scriptures teaches us teach us to maintain our joy. You know, count it all joy, brethren. James says, when you endure temptations, trials, tribulations. Count it all joy. Because the trying of your faith produces patience or endurance. And when endurance has completed its work, you will come out perfect, lacking nothing. So while we are going through it, through the hardship, we need to maintain our joy. Stay joyful. Is there going to be, is it going to be discomforting? Yeah, of course. Are we pressed down? We feel crushed. Do we feel persecuted? Do we feel perplexed? 
yeah, all those things will come, as Paul wrote in Second Corinthians chapter four. Those those emotions will be there, but we can choose to maintain our joy. You still choose to look to God and praise Him and say, God, I know that these afflictions are for a te they're temporary. I'm looking at what is eternal. I'm living for what is eternal. Therefore, I can re be joyful going through what I'm going through. Second is we consider the good that is happening and we pray. Right? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Right? This is what James says. I mean, so you're going through some afflictions, hardships, trials. What do you do? Pray. Right? And you give thanks to God. You're merry, sing songs. So look, think, think about the good that's coming out of it. And you just pray and say, Lord, give me the strength. To stay faithful, give me the strength to go joyfully through this, uh, unwavering in my faith as I go through this. And as Paul wrote, number point number three is we look at what is eternal. Right. So Paul says, you know, while we do not look at what is temporal, seen, but what is unseen, what is seen is temporal, but what is not seen is eternal. Right? So that's how we go through it. Our eyes are, are what is eternal. Our eyes are looking unto Jesus. Our eyes are looking unto the glory that God has for us. So we keep our eyes on that. So then we know that even as we go through these things, we can stay firm, stand strong, and endure it. Right? So maintain your joy, pray, keep looking at what's eternal. Three things we do when we endure these hardships. Now, we talk a little bit about persecution. Persecution is when people are attacking us specifically for our faith and for righteousness sake. That means because we're believers in Jesus and because we do what's right, we want to stand for the truth. We want to stand for integrity. We want to stand for uprightness. We don't want to compromise on those things. And we will be persecuted. They might speak mean things against us. They might try to harm us. They might try to attack us in some one way or another. That's persecution. For righteousness' sake or for the gospel's sake. What do we what do we do? One, take needed uh, precaution. Okay. So let's start here. In Hebrews 30, okay, support those who are being persecuted. So sometimes we may not ourselves face it, but others may be facing it. Do what we can to help them. Right? Now, of course, we can't help everybody. That people being persecuted all over the world, we don't even know. But at least in situations where you know somebody is being affected, do what you can to help them. Support those who are being persecuted. Secondly, uh, take needed pre precaution. Right. So Jesus said in Matthew 10, if they persecute you in one city, you go to another. He didn't say stay there and get killed. If they persecute in one, you go to a safer place. Go to another city. Why? Because if you're alive, you can serve the purpose of God. You, you know. So it's not that we're afraid to die, but we want to take precautions so that we can continue serving God, continue standing for the truth, continue proclaiming the truth as long as possible on the earth. So take needed precaution. It's not wrong to take needed precaution. Third, we are not terrified. Uh, just you know, that means there's no fear. Yes, there will be persecution. Those who are godly, Paul wrote in Philippians 1 28, he says, Those who are godly will suffer persecution. So, and he says, Know that you're called to suffer for his name's sake. Right? So it's part of our calling. We know that those who are godly, Paul wrote in Timothy, he said, Those who are godly will suffer persecution. So it's part of our calling. We are not afraid, we are not terrified. We stand for. Be protection minded. That means don't say, oh, uh, sorry, spelling mistake here. Um, be protection minded. Like, be conscious of God protecting you rather than, oh, I'm going to suffer. Right? Be protection minded, not persecution minded. You know, don't keep talking about persecution all the time. It's there. We know it's part of our calling, but we are going to believe in God who protects us and endure. To the end. That means you say you be, you're committed to the Lord. Say, God, no matter what's going to happen, I'm going to stand to this the end of time. 
And one, one other point I will add is, if needed, we can take legal action, right? That means do whatever is permissible within civil law for your own safety, for your protection. And we see Paul the Apostle doing this, you know, when he was apprehended, attacked by the Jews and handed to the Romans, his simple question was, hey, he told them, uh, this is Acts 16 and on, he said, hey, I am a Roman citizen. Immediately, they had to treat him differently because you cannot arrest and put a Roman citizen in jail without giving him a fair trial. Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen. I was born in Tarsus, though he was a Jew. Because he was born in the city of Tarsus, they were given, those who were born there were, were, were given the privilege of being a Roman citizen. So he said, I'm a Roman citizen. Immediately they took their hands off. They said, hey, we can't do this. You know. So they released him. And then he said, I'm appealing to Caesar. He had a right to appeal to Caesar. He said, I'm appealing to Caesar. So they said, okay, if you appeal to Caesar, we have to bring you to Caesar. That means at their expense, at the expense of the Roman government, they had to take him all the way to Rome so that he could appeal to Caesar, which is like the Supreme Court, if you want to look at it. In other words, he was exercising his civil rights as a Roman citizen, and Paul did that. So we also must understand that uh, we can, whatever's permitted within the law of our country, we can exercise our rights as citizens of the country for our own protection and the exercise of our religious freedom. So that's 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 perfectly fine. So um, these are some things to keep in mind, all all in the context of suffering and persecution. How do we look at it? What should our response be, and so on? Let me pause here and take questions on the subject. I know it's a big topic, but uh, feel free to please ask your questions uh, at this time. Any questions? <laughs> um, were you all following me or? Um... Okay, all right. Fine, shall we move forward? Um, and, uh, or if there are any questions, we can take them now. If not, we will move forward. Okay, I'm going to move forward and please feel free to ask any questions uh, so that things can be clear, okay? So let's go to the next chapter. Don't hesitate to ask questions. All right, just give me a minute. There's um, somebody at the door. I just need to uh, answer. Just, just give me a minute. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. So there's a question here in the chat um, from Ren saying, can death also be counted as suffering? Where we may face many loss in our lives. Mm. So the subject of death, can it be counted as suffering? So, I mean, one, how will that build our character? So one is 
Okay, let's look at it from different angles. One is, if a person is going to be martyred for Christ, that is suffering for the sake of Jesus. And how will that build character? Of Obviously, it will build character in the leading up to that. As a, obviously, when, the, when we die, we are no longer on this side of uh, heaven. Uh, but in leading up to the point of being martyred, it's, um, it's going to build our character. That means it's going to strengthen our resolve. It's going to strengthen our commitment to Christ. It's going to increase our love for Jesus. Jesus, I love you so much. I'm willing to die for you. And we stand that test until a person, and we are, as believers, you're martyred. So in that sense, that martyrdom is a suffering for Christ. We face the loss of our own lives. What good has it done? It has strengthened our resolve, increased our love for Christ, and it has enabled us to demonstrate our love. Jesus said it like this in John 15, greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friend. And this is the highest expression of love. And so in leading up to that, you know, our expression of love and uh, our commitment to Jesus is strengthened. So in that sense, it builds our character. Now, if you look at that as in a natural process, meaning every person is appointed to die once. So in that sense, we would not look at it as a suffering, but we would look at it as a natural process. It, every person has to die. It is appointed unto man once to die. Now, how that, that takes place could be you know, so many different ways for different people. That itself, uh, just like that life on earth ends, it will end for every person. So that itself, we, we won't consider it suffering for the person who died. Now, obviously, for the people who are alive, they go through grief, they go through loss. Um, it's part of our life here on earth for everyone. So again, how, uh, I wouldn't, it doesn't, uh, for that, our response to the loss of a loved one is entirely, it's variable and how people respond to it varies. So, and, uh, uh, some look at it as suffering because there's so much of grief in it, so much of pain in it. Some are able to handle it more positively. So that varies, that experience varies. Uh, but should we always say it's suffering? I don't think so, because we know it's part of life. It happens to everyone. And uh, it is appointed unto us once to die. Yeah? Uh, so there's a follow-up question. What about losing a loved one? So some people may say that God allow, has allowed me to go through this because he wanted to teach me something. Well, uh, the fact is, when we lose a loved one, there's always grief, and it happens to everybody, believer, unbeliever, or you know, everybody. There is grief when you lose a loved one, and uh, uh, and we all face it. It's all part of life. So I don't. I, we find our comfort and strength in God, but I don't think it's it's right to say God took that person away in order to teach me something. You know, no. Uh, it's part of our part of our life on earth, and I think it's it's wrong to say God took that person away to teach me something. No. What we should say is, I'm learning something more about God as I go through this loss. Right? So we do learn more about God as we journey through life, through all of life situations, one of which is the loss of a loved one. But we don't attribute that loss to God, but we say, I am learning to depend on God for my comfort, my strength. I think that's the right way to state it, rather than saying, God took that person away in order to teach me something. So I think our perspective needs to change. It needs to be more biblical. It needs to be correct. Uh, and uh, yes, we will learn some things. Learning to trust in God and depend on God as we go through grief and loss and other situations in life. Is that okay? All right. 
All right, let's um, move to our next chapter and then we will uh, take some questions as well on that. So the last chapter we want to talk about is social challenges. Now, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. So there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that are happening in society, the world around us, right? Uh, so the question is, how should the church respond to this? And then there are so many different challenges where, um, and there probably are going to be new things coming up in days to come. How do we respond to it? How should we respond to these challenges as believers? So what uh, we want to do in this chapter, rather than trying to address every situation, we want to give a framework by which we can guide our thought, our thinking, so that in days to come, if there are going to be new challenges, different challenges, at least we will know how to think about those challenges from a biblical framework, right? So what is the church's responsibility? Um, First Timothy chapter three verse fifteen, the apostle Paul tells us that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. Pillar representing upholding, ground meaning foundation. So the church must be the upholder and the foundation of truth in this world. So while there's a lot of things happening in the world, in the society, all kinds of things, the church must stand strong. It must uphold truth. It must be the foundation of truth. So if people want to know what is truth, what is right, they look to the church. The church must stand that way. So the question is, how do we uphold truth and still be a voice in all of these complex things that are happening around us, the social challenges? How do we uphold truth and still relate to people in a healthy way so that we can draw them to faith in Christ rather than push them away, right? And, and then that leads us to several questions, meaning should the church be in, involved in trying to pass legislature, that means get involved in the government and make sure all the laws are biblical, etc., or is the church called to be engaged in the spiritual realm? Or should the church do both, right? So we need to think about those things and try to provide an answer. So we'll, we'll give a framework for this. So first of all, a biblical framework is, look at how God is dealing with sinners. So that, you know, that means, how does God deal with the world that has gone away from him? Does he like keep on draining fire and brimstone every day saying, you people have left me, so I'm mad at you, I'm angry with you, and every day there's fire and brimstone on every person. Or how does God deal with us as sinners? We have wandered away from God. How does he relate to us? Here are some things. First, he never overrides our human will. From the time Adam and Eve were in the garden, God didn't control human will. He respected choice. He respected choice. You have the freedom to choose. So when God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he said, look, here's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Here's the tree of life. And don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He respected the freedom he gave them. So when Adam and Eve chose to eat of the tree, he said they shouldn't eat. He didn't rain fire and brimstone. He didn't manipulate their will. No. He respected their choice. And the outcome of the choice, he let it unfold. So God respects human will. And so we must also be respectful of other people's freedom to choose. Second, how does God work with people? He communicates to us what's right and wrong. And then he invites us to choose what's right. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. In other words, God is saying, look, I'll tell you what's right, I'll tell you what's wrong, and I'm inviting you to do what's right, but the choice is yours. So he expresses it, he communicates it, but he doesn't force us, he doesn't condemn us. No, he tells us what's right, then he says, you make the choice. God is willing to reason with us. 
So we are sinners. But he says, okay, let's reason together. You bring your reasons why you're doing what you're doing. Come, let's reason together, he says. You bring your reasons. So God is willing to even reason with us. Right? Fourth, even while we are sinners, God treats us with love and fairness. And Jesus put it like this in Matthew 5. He said, look at look what God does. Look at your heavenly father. He gives rain. He gives sun to the righteous and to the unrighteous, to the just and to the unjust. So he says, be like your father. That means he treats everybody with love and fairness, even the sinners. He treats them with love and fairness. That's, that's God. Right? And number five, while God is doing all these things, he does not compromise truth. That means he himself is truthful, holy, just love. That doesn't change. Right? So this is a framework to say, let's be imitators of God. This is how God is dealing with people who have broken his heart, who have gone away from him. They're doing all kinds of evil, and yet this is how God works with them. He does not override their will. He tells what's right and wrong. He invites us to make the choice. He's willing to reason with us. He treats us with love and fairness, but he does not compromise himself. He is who he is. He doesn't change. So you and I must now take that same approach. And when we are dealing with people who disagree with us, when we're dealing with people who, you know, may be full of hate, they want to fight or they want to do all kinds of things, hey, communicate truth and love, be willing to reason, treat them with love and fairness, don't compromise. You don't personally compromise you know, your conviction of truth. And you stand by truth, but don't force it on them. Don't try to override their will, because God respects their will. God respects their choice. Whatever it may be, he still respects it. Right? So that's our framework. Now, there are many areas where the Bible is silent. Right? So what do we do? You know, we can't point to a chapter and verse specifically and say, hey, this is what the Bible is saying about, you know, gene modification of uh, gene editing. There was no technology in those days, you know, to go and edit the genes, but people are doing it. And what the Bible doesn't say there's no chapter and verse, but we can speak from the nature of God. We can speak from the general revelation of Scripture. And we can also speak from this biblical framework that we have. That means we're going to imitate God. How does God deal with people? This is how he deals with it. So that's how we're going to respond to these things. So we're going to address certain common social challenges. We cover whatever we can. But remember, there will be other things coming up in days to come. And we just have, we have to keep this framework in mind. And from that basis, we approach various situations. So think about marriage, homosexuality, and same-sex marriage. Now, this is just increasing all over the world. They've even tried in our own country in India. They tried to they tried made an attempt to legalize uh, same-sex marriage. Now, of course, as of now, that's not come through in our country. Uh, uh, so, but in other parts of the world, it's 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 legally okay. Uh, the civil government is standing behind these kinds of things. And so, how do we respond to it? So, one, we know God created marriage to be one between one man and woman. The Bible does not approve of this same-sex marriage. Homosexuality is sin. And there are several scriptures on it. So we know it's wrong before God. So that's our stand, right? And but yet we love the people who may be involved in a homosexual lifestyle or in a same-sex marriage. We love the people. We do not approve of the sin, and yet we don't compromise our stand. So that's how we have to maintain the balance. But then there are practical situations, right? 
for example, if you're a business owner, and these are situations that have happened or keep happening. So if you're a business owner and you know you're running a bakery and somebody a gay couple comes and says, Hey, it's our wedding, can you make a cake for us? Now you're happy to make a cake for yeah, everyone, but in this case, you're making a cake which is going which is going to be used in a wedding of a gay couple, which you don't approve of that. So how are you going to respond to it? What are you going to do? Now, you, we can take one of two approaches. One, you can say, well, I'll just make the cake. What you do with the cake is your problem. I'm not involved in it. And that's perfectly fine. Because we are not going to control people's choices. You're the baker, you bake the cake. You know, whether people go and take the cake and, you know, smash it on somebody else's head or you know, they take the cake and use in whatever context, whether it's a birthday cake or a wedding cake, whatever, you know, you say, well, that's not my responsibility. That's one way of doing it. Or you could say, well, I do not stand for such marriages. Therefore, I will not bake a cake that is going to be used in that context. That's also a perfect decision. So I think that that decision should come from the individual's conviction, The in this case, the business owner. That person, as a believer, is free to make the decision. And I feel that either way is fine. Uh, you know, it's between you and God. The Bible says that each man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, and you, you, in one case, you can say, well, look, I honor these people. They want to eat cake. I'll make cake for them. But they may be in a same-sex marriage. That is their choice. I cannot dictate their choice. I'm not here to um, police them in their marriage. So I'm staying out of it. I make cake. I'll give them the cake they want. That's one way of looking at it. Another person may say, hey, I don't want to be involved because I know that this is going to be used in a same-sex marriage. I don't want to be a part of it. Another believer may take that position. Okay. Each one stand by their conviction. And, you know, we don't, we can't say this is right, that's wrong. You stand by your conviction and uh, do, you know, you handle that situation the way you feel it's right before God, but your conscience is clear before God. Right? But, you know, a situation like this has gone up, you know, to, to legally, it went to, because of business owner refused to do it, they, it went into, uh, uh, this is in the United States. So, again, the civil court had to decide what they do, want to do. Like this, there are other situations, right? What if you are the HR in an, in an organization where you have to, hire people regardless of their sexual orientation. So obviously, a working the HR of an organization, you're hiring people not because of their sexual orientation, you're hiring people because of the skill they bring. So we'll have, you know, okay, let me pause here. I know we've come into a break time. We'll pick up after the break on this and uh, we'll take this forward. So let's go for a 10 minute break and we'll come back. Um, uh, to this, okay, and I see some questions coming up in the chat. We'll answer them as well. Okay, let's be back in ten minutes. Thank you.